And in the third chapter today of the book of John, verses 22 through 31, I put it on the screen over my head for those of you today here who do not have a Bible. And the word of the Lord reads from the King James text. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing, except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more quick moment. Father, we love you so very much, Lord, and the word of God is the most important part of any church service. There's nothing more important to the people of God than your word. For it's the word of God that serves as sustenance. It serves as food on our table. It is bread. It is wine. It is water for the people of God. We need to hear from heaven. The last thing in the world we need today, God, is to hear doctrines of men and mandates and dictates that are earthly born but Lord today we need to hear from the Holy Ghost we need to hear from you I claim no divine privilege I claim no special place but Lord you called me as a child to preach the word of the Lord and if a preacher is to preach the word of God then they first must prayerfully, with meditation and time and silence, they must find a word from God to bring to the people of God. We must first hear from heaven if we are to convey to the people of God that which you would convey. Anoint, Master, today every word that is spoken. Help me. To not say one single word out of turn, but let every word that I speak today be a word from God for the people of God, that they might benefit, that they might bear fruit, that their joy might increase, that their faith might be elevated. Master, today, not only those in this place today, but all those who watch now by reason of the internet, as well as those who will later watch by reason of recording. <clears throat> we ask it all today, in the precious name of Jesus, Amen. I put a title on my message today, Step Back. And I put a picture on the illustration that you see behind my head 
of a homeless man kind of sitting in the sidewalk preaching as it were. You can tell he's talking to somebody anyway. I don't know if he's preaching or what. But I'm going to tell you, this man more resembles John the Baptist than any preacher standing in any pulpit in America today. A lot of people don't realize that John the Baptist was a very rough, scruff, dirty character. He was not anything that uh, would generally appeal to many people. John, the Bible said, wore camel's hair, one of the most uh, uncomfortable if you've ever had experience with camel's hair uh, as a, a fabric for garments, it is like wool, it's scratchy, it's itchy, it's uncomfortable. It was very easily obtained in biblical times. It was the Walmart fabric, so it was cheap. John didn't dress to impress. He didn't try to impress anybody with his appearance. He abode in the wilderness where there were not a number of comforts and, uh, uh, you know, staying clean and smelling nice were not altogether the easiest things in the world to do when you live in a hot, arid wilderness. But some of the religious men of Jesus' time came to John and they said, you know, there was... This man that you bore witness to and you said that he was the Christ. Well, you know, right now he is baptizing more people than you did. And yet you baptized him. See, it's almost they were trying to kind of chide him a little bit. Now, you baptized this guy and all of a sudden he's out there baptizing people. And he's got more people coming to him now than you have coming to you. And John began to explain to them. He said, now listen, y'all can bear witness. Y'all can tell me if I'm telling the truth or not. But didn't I tell you I wasn't the Christ? Didn't I say that to you? Yeah, I did. He said, well, if I'm not the Christ, and He is, and that's what I've said, then why would I not be happy at the news that he is doing more with his ministry than I'm doing with mine? Boy, I'm going to tell you, humility is something you do not find in, in many churches today, and you certainly don't find it in a lot of preachers. I'm going to tell you, I watch and listen to a lot of preachers, and it always makes me laugh how... How many preachers run around and, and they are just gloating in and glorying in numbers? How many people did you have in church last Sunday? Why, we're running about 300 or we're running 500 these days. And boy, they're just as proud as a peacock that they've got a church with that many people in it. And we baptized this many people last month. And we had this many people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost last month. And boy, I'm going to tell you, having been part of a major Pentecostal denomination in years past, I can tell you that there is this whole culture of numbers. It's all about numbers. And if anything has humbled me in the last 25 years plus that I've been doing LGBT affirming ministry, uh, it is the fact that I can't fill this church house any better than I can fill it. I'd love today for this church to have a whole lot more people in it than it's got. I'd love today to be able to preach and have hundreds of people in the audience. Now, do I say that because, uh, you know, then I could have bragging rights as to how many people there were in the church? No, that's not my reasoning. My reasoning is... I believe that the message we preach is a positive, hopeful, 
message that could benefit and help a lot of people. I just wish to God a whole lot more people would come so they could hear it. Yep. I don't need bragging rights. I'm not worried about bragging rights. John the Baptist got it right and he told these men who came to him. He said, listen, you can only get what God gives you. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Uh -huh. He said, you can only get what God gives you. Well, I've got news for you today, folks. I can only get what God gives me. Do you know how many preachers have quit preaching? If they had the number of people in their church that I've got in mind. Do you know how many preachers I've watched quit preaching over the last 25, 26 years? Almost 27 years since I started my LGBT affirming ministry. Do you know how many preachers I've seen quit preaching? I know preachers today who are driving truck because they gave up ministry. Because they couldn't get more than a handful of people to come and listen to them preach. And boy, it dealt a bigger blow to their self-esteem. And it dealt a bigger blow to their ego than they could handle. Too bad they didn't understand humility like John the Baptist understood humility. Because if they understood it the way John explained it, they'd understand that you can only work with what God gives you. That's right. If there are not thousands of LGBT people and people who are willing to worship beside LGBT people. See, that's what puts our church in a unique place. Because we're not an LGBT church by any stretch of the imagination. But there are many non-LGBT people, for those of you who don't know what that means, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. It is a term that is basically all-inclusive of people who are not falling into the heterosexual category in terms of their sexual orientation, in terms of their gender identification. The term LGBT simply means, you know, a little circle that takes in everybody else that doesn't identify as heterosexual or born male or born female, whatever the case might be. Our church is affirming of LGBT people. How could we not be? I'm living the experience myself. I know what it is to be gay. I know what it is. I don't need some preacher to tell me, well, you woke up one morning and made a choice and blah, blah, blah. Oh, stupid, shut up and go to sleep. I know what this experience is because I'm living it. How could I pastor a church that isn't affirming of LGBT people when I'm part of that community? But our church is not an LGBT exclusive church. We have people all over the world who love our ministry and they follow us online, they watch our videos, they tune in to us live on Sundays at 3 o'clock who are straight as an arrow, married, have children, happily heterosexual, but they love this ministry, they love our message, they love what we say because we're not an LGBT church, but we're a church that acknowledges that the church as a whole has not treated LGBT people very well. And for that reason, we make a very sincere, concerted effort to reach out to LGBT people and welcome them and include them in our church. So we're not an LGBT church by any means. But you know what? Just try to build a church that's LGBT inclusive and affirming and see how quick your church grows. Got news for you. Uh, the majority of LGBT affirming churches in our world today literally have fewer than a couple dozen members. I didn't know this when I first started in affirming ministry. I thought that, you know, I was so excited about God helping me to understand my faith as it related to who I am as a, uh, an LGBT person. I was so excited. I thought, Tommy, people would rush into the house of God to hear this wonderful good news. I really did. I thought for sure that in short order we'd have a church with hundreds of people. 
Well, I found out real fast that wasn't going to happen. I found out that people who have been hurt, people who have been spit on, people who have actually been pinned to the floor at the front of their church while the pastor and other members tried to exercise and cast out the spirit of homosexuality from them. And this has been a lot of people's experience, folks. I found out that this community is so afraid of and so shy about anything with the word Christian on it that even if you stand there and explain to them over and over and over again, our church is welcoming and affirming and inclusive of LGBT people, they still view you with great trepidation. They still look at you very uh, uh, fearfully. And it's extremely difficult to do the work that I do. Then we have people who come into our church who are non-LGBT. They're straight. We've had families come in, husbands with wives and children, and they love our church. They love it. Until we start explaining to them our position regarding empty people being included in the kingdom of God and being included in the gospel message. And we've had we had one young man with his wife and little girl, you remember, who came all the way from Waco, Texas, every Sunday. For those of you who don't know where Waco is, as it relates to Dallas, that's about a 90-minute drive. This man came every Sunday, every Sunday with his wife and daughter, Spanish man, for months until we had a discussion about our position on LGBT Christianity. He couldn't take it. He couldn't swallow it. Because after all, I've been taught that this is wrong. I've been taught that these people are wicked and evil. I've been taught that God, you know, eschews these people. And this is an abomination. And, blah, 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 blah. and we never have seen him again since then. Although I'll tell you right now, he stays in touch with me online through Facebook and all that. We still count him as a friend. It's hard to do the work we do. It's hard to find gay and lesbian people, transgendered people, bisexual people who want to come in and be part of a church and make the sacrifices that are necessary to grow a church. Because when you start a church from scratch, I'm going to tell you something. The people who are at the, the start of any church have to really put a lot of elbow grease in and they have to put resources in. They have to put time and energy in. They have to put money in. Because if they don't, that church is going nowhere fast. I started three churches in the mainstream, as I call it, before I came out in 89. I started three non-LGBT affirming churches while I was still part of the mainstream church. Every one of them was fast growing. Every one of them, we had no problem getting more and more new people. Every one of them, within a matter of months, we had musicians and we had worship leaders and we had people qualified to teach and we had all kinds of resources to work with. Every one of those first three churches. When I came into affirming ministry, no, it's been an uphill battle every step of the way. I've been at it for 26 years, and it has not eased up one iota in 26 years. It literally has not changed one bit in 26 years. Pastor Charles, why do you go into all that? Why do you, well, you're depressing me. I'll tell you why. Because I can only work with what God gives me. If there are not enough people in our community, LGBT, and those who are willing to worship and serve the Lord beside LGBT people, if there are not enough of those people in this community to fill this building, 
then that's just what it is. But the few there are, I'm obligated by my calling to minister to. You see, nowhere in the Word of God does God say, if you don't get at least, you know, five dozen people, then you're not obligated to minister to those. No. John said, listen, Jesus is baptizing more than I'm baptizing, and that's fine. I told you. He's the one we've been waiting for. Not me. Him. So why should it be any surprise that he's doing more than I'm doing? All I can work with is what God sends me. One of the things God sent me years ago was a computer. One of the things the Lord sent me years ago was a video camera. I knew many years ago that the ministry of the future was through the Internet. So many, many years ago, we began putting our sermons. At first, we used to put them on the Internet in audio because that's the only technology I knew. Eventually, it got to the place where I understood how to videotape services and how to put them onto YouTube and what have you. So we began to share our services through YouTube and all. Then as time went on, I became aware of technology that allowed us to air our services live. We started out airing live through YouTube and then eventually uh, uh, Facebook made it available to us. We began to minister live on Facebook. So guess what? All I can minister to is what the Lord sends me. And those of you who are watching today on Facebook, thank you. Because you are much of the reason why this ministry is here. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because you're part of what the Lord has sent me to minister to. Whoever tunes in, doesn't matter whether a hundred people tune in or ten people tune in. It doesn't matter. The fact is... God has called me to minister to you, and by God, I'm going to do everything in my power to do it. Amen. But humility is necessary. Listen to me now, children. Humility is necessary if you're going to be able to accept whatever God sends you. People who are proud, people who are full of pride, they cannot accept, Tommy, whatever the Lord sends them. No, because they have it in their mind. They deserve so much more. Uh -huh. Well, I deserve a church. I remember my first overseer in the Church of God, Brother G.J. Chandler. He made me laugh. He came when I was starting my first church. He came to me. He said, boy, said, I know God called you to preach. I know the Lord called you to preach. He said, do you know how many young preachers come to me and they want the church of God to rent them this big, beautiful church building that seats 500 people? And they say, oh, I'll start a church in that building and boy, I'll fill it up and, and boy, we'll just have us a great church. He said, you'd be shocked how many young preachers come to me with those kind of requests. He said, you came to me and said, Brother Overseer, I found this old building in Seymour, Connecticut that doesn't have bathrooms, but that's okay. We'll bring in porta potties. I found this old building over here in Seymour, Connecticut. It's an old diner. It's in terrible disrepair. It really needs a lot of work, but that's okay, brother, because if I have to put in 10 hours a day for four months, I'll get that building looking halfway decent. But it doesn't matter what the building looks like. Once we begin to preach the power of God and the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God, once we begin to preach this great Pentecostal message, people will come because it doesn't matter what the building looks like. The message is far more powerful than the structure. I believed that then, and I got news for you, I still believe it. Dallas is one of the most pretentious cities in America. I believe that with everything I've got. I've never seen a town where people were so stinking caught up in image 
and looks and labels and brands. My God, if you don't live in a certain neighborhood in Dallas, people will literally, they'll be talking to you one minute, and they will turn around and walk away from you without a word, without saying a word. You'll be standing there thinking you're having a conversation, and when they find out you don't live in White Rock Lake, or you don't live in Oak Lawn, or you don't live in Lake Highlands, or you don't live in Highland Park, all of a sudden they'll just turn and walk away from you as if they were never talking to you to begin with. That's how bad it is in this town. The Lord told me when He called me to preach, He said, you're going to have a ministry like John the Baptist. Oh boy, that isn't good for Dallas. Because John the Baptist ministered in the most ugly and inconvenient and uncomfortable place, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The wilderness. Yep. All the years, Tommy, we've been in Dallas. We've never been able to get a location. We've never been able to secure a place in a desirable neighborhood. No, we've gotten some nice plot little places. We've gotten some nice little storefronts. We've set them up real nice. They've looked real pretty, but they weren't in the right neighborhood. So trying to get people to come to them was like trying to pull teeth. No, they weren't going to come. But I've ministered to whoever the Lord did send because I've learned humility enough to know that you can only work with what God sends you. Humility is something we don't find in very many preachers today. Humility is something we don't find in a lot of believers today. Humility is something that works against human nature. Human, human beings don't like being told to step back. Human beings don't like being told. Uh, you need to ride on the back of the bus. Because see, the, the, the lesser desirables go to the back. And the more desirables are allowed to be up forward. Am I telling the truth? Yeah, if some old homeless guy crawls into your church on Sunday... And boy, I mean, he stinks, and he's got rat tatty clothes and all. Uh, most ushers are not, if they even let the guy stay in the church, most ushers aren't going to lead him up to the front row and sit him down where everybody in the church can see him. Oh, no, no, no. I've been told we've got a church here in Dallas that's world famous. They're on television. The pastor is, you know, well known. I'm not going to say his name. I'm not going to name the church. But I've been told that, oh, they have a certain area in their church where they sit celebrities when celebrities come to visit. You know why? Because that row or that section gets caught on camera as they're filming the pastor preaching. So they want to make sure that the celebrities are on camera. Yeah, they don't bring the homeless folks in and put them up front. No, no, no. They put all the famous faces, all the people that are world-renowned, because they want everybody to see, look who we draw. Look who we attract. Look at the kind of audience that we bring in. Hello now, am I telling the truth? Humility is not something that human beings, as a rule, just fall into. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Humility takes work. The Bible said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Humble yourself. That means uh, chances are you're not going to just be naturally humble. Now, a lot of people misconstrue and misunderstand, and they think that if someone has a poor self-image or if someone has low self-esteem, that that is humility. No, 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 no. Someone can have low self-esteem and be so full of pride it would blow your mind. Someone can have a poor self-image and be so proud that it would make you crazy. I know people who are some, some of the poorest people on the planet. But boy, they got more pride in them than anybody you've ever seen in your life. 
So self-esteem, poor self-esteem is not humility. Having a poor self-image is not humility. Humility is being willing to step back. Humility is being willing to say, you know what, it's okay if the other guy goes ahead of me. It's okay if the other person goes ahead. I'm not so proud that I, I feel like, you know, I when I wait just a minute, I'm as good as anybody else, so I ought to be able to. No, humility, true humility, is finding the ability to step back a little bit and let others be preferred ahead of you. This was the experience of John the Baptist. He said of Jesus, He must increase, but I must decrease. You see, people often want to make the gospel all about the messenger. But the messenger is of little importance as the power of the truth is in the message, not the one who bears that message. I used to love years ago to watch Jimmy Swagger preach and sing. My grandfather Bill was a big fan of Jimmy Swaggart's and you go over to Grandma and Grandpa Bill's house and I mean Jimmy Swaggart a lot of times be on the the turntable. Yeah, I'm old enough, kids. I remember turntables, you know, records. Oh my goodness. Some of the young people are getting their dictionaries out, you know, they're starting to type in the word record. What is a record? Never heard of it. He didn't say DVD. Grandpa would be playing his Jimmy Swagger records, and oh, I used to love to listen to Jimmy Swagger sing, and he was quite a preacher. Then all of a sudden, in the late 80s, this thing come along. Jimmy Swagger had some demons. He had some issues in his life, and it became exposed, and all of a sudden, people were just falling by the wayside, crushed. By the knowledge that Jimmy Swagger was not perfect. Well, duh. How is it that that came as such a great surprise to you? Well, but Jimmy Swagger had sin in his life. Well, so do you. Are you honestly going to sit there and tell me that you don't? This same John, this same author of the passage we're using as our primary text today, in his epistle, this same John said that if we say we have no sin, we're calling God a liar and the truth is not in us. Got news for you, children. We all, every one of us got our secrets. Every one of us got our little quiet areas in our life. We all have our little dark closets where our skeletons are buried, whatever they may be. And God expects us certainly to pursue and to live the best, godliest, moralist life that we can live and lead as an example to the unbeliever and as a witness to the unbeliever. But by no means does that mean that we don't have our issues. We don't have our sins. We don't have our secrets. We don't have our weaknesses and our faults. Of course we do. But oh boy, let the messenger be exposed as having sin in his life. And all of a sudden people begin to call into question the message. That Jimmy Swagger preached. I said, what are y'all crazy? Do you think for one minute that the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ rests upon whether or not Jimmy Swaggart is perfect? Do you really think that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ hangs in the balances of whether or not the person carrying the message is as sinless as the one who is the focus of the message? No. The messenger is of little significance. And John stated one of the most important truths. He said, he must increase. I must decrease. For me to preach today to so small an audience, I've had to learn because it wasn't easy. I had to learn to humble myself. I had to learn to accept 
whatever it was that God sent me. Because like John said, I can only take what God sends me. I can only minister to whoever God sends my way. It took some humbling of myself to accept that fact and I tell the truth and then I finally had to realize Charles step back step back step back get out of God's way it's not important how you look in this scenario mm -hmm. it's important how he looks just keep lifting him up just keep preaching his message just preach keep preaching his gospel that's where the power is in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul said, listen, I'm not ashamed of this message because that's where the power is. See, changing people's life. I've had people come into my churches that I've pastored over the years, and I've seen people delivered from demons. I've seen people, through the power of God, overcome alcohol addiction, drug addiction, sex addiction, you name it. I've seen miracles. I've seen God heal people and deliver people. I've had family members come to me. One lady that God delivered from demons in our church, Margaret, you wouldn't believe the change in this woman after God delivered her from the demons she had and filled her with the Holy Ghost. You wouldn't believe the difference in this woman. It was, it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. And her two children came to me. And they, they were teenagers. And they said, Pastor Charles, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing for my mother what you've done. She's a brand new woman. And I said, oh, hold up a minute. Oh, hold on a minute. Step back a minute. <laughs> oh, don't you dare thank me. I don't have the power to do anything. There is nothing in me. There's no power in me. The power is in the message that I preach. Hallelujah. And it's that message which is Jesus. Amen. It's that message that's changed your mother's life. It's that message that delivered your mother. It's that message that brought this new woman into your family. It wasn't this man. Please do not thank me. If you ever watch a documentary about Jim Jones and the Jonestown Massacre, you'll find that while he was still in the United States pastoring a church, he started out a good man. I want to tell you folks, if you don't, if you don't get a handle on this humility thing, it'll destroy you. The Word of God said, Pride cometh before the fall. You ain't going to stand for long if you let pride rule your life and dictate. It, it, it ain't going to happen. Pride comes before the fall. Jim Jones, if you look at his early ministry, he believed in the equality of races. He hated racism. He preached against racism. His church was uh, full of people from all different uh, races and backgrounds and skin colors. And he believed in the power of God. He believed in miracles. He believed God answered prayer early in his ministry. But then, as the years went by, something began to happen. People in his church would get up, and it's recorded, there's video of this. People would get up in his church and they'd say, Oh, I was healed of this, or I was healed of that. Thank you, Brother Jones. And he would just stand there with well, you. Uh, Brother Jones, you needed to step back. Yes. You needed to understand that he must increase, I must decrease. You needed to understand the power was in the gospel, not in you. You needed to clarify and make clear that you are not the source of that miracle. 
The message you preached was. But he didn't. And it took him down a dark and ugly path. And he began to erode and corrode until he became something wicked and evil and horrible. I'm going to tell you today, folks, preachers better be careful. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but preachers better be careful. The vessel is not as important as what the vessel contains. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, the Apostle Paul once again writes, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's like putting a priceless pearl inside a clay container. That clay container is worth nothing, but the pearl that it contains is worth an awful lot. And you know what? It wouldn't take a whole lot to destroy the container, but it would take a whole lot more to destroy the pearl. Mm -hmm. We have this treasure. The power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, contained in earthen vessels. Listen to what Paul said. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Long as you remember you're the clay pot, not the pearl. Then you'll always understand that the excellency is of God and not of us. Hallelujah. Amen. We are just the container. We are just the messenger. The Word of God tells us today, May uh, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. John 3.15 declares, as well as verse 16 and 18, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 18, John 3, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. In John 3 verse 36, the Word of God declares, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abide on him. John 6, 35 and verse 40. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Verse 40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on Him, may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. John 7, verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the Scriptures hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 12, 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Acts 10, verse 43, to him, speaking of Jesus, give all the prophets witness that through his name, Whosoever believeth in Him shall receive remission of sins. Romans 4 and verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on Him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 9, 33, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, 
a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. What are you trying to say, Pastor? Let me tell you. It doesn't matter if a homeless man in rags or the local fire chief runs door to door in an apartment building banging and sounding a warning that the building's on fire. Doesn't matter, Tommy, if it's a homeless man in rags or if it's the fire chief banging on doors, waking people up, does it? No. The messenger is of little importance, but the message they bear can be life-saving. When someone tries first to make you believe that they are the one and true messenger, run. Run. The only messenger whom we are to believe and trust implicitly is that messenger which came down from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. No man has, nor has any man been given, exclusive power over the message of the gospel. The power is in the message. The message is Christ. The power is not in the messenger. It's in the message. The Roman Catholic Church claims that it has exclusive power over the gospel of Jesus Christ. They claim by reason of apostolic succession. Every priest we have can trace his ordination back to the hands of the apostles. Yeah, and you think the apostles didn't anoint somebody? They didn't uh, ordained somebody who wound up going rogue and preaching a message that was completely contradictory to the truth of God? Of course there were. We know there were. The Bible tells us that there were. In 1 John 2, verses 28 and 29, excuse me, 18 and 19, the same John who gave us our primary text today writes and says, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. So the apostles were still living. They weren't even dead yet. And the apostles said, There are already Antichrists. Many Antichrists. He said, whereby we know that it is the last time. Listen to verse 19. They went out from us. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So the claim to apostolic succession being what gives them exclusive rights to claim that they are the one true church and they are the only church that has divine authority over the message of the gospel is a bunch of crap. There are other organizations. Every cult organization in the world, the primary identifier of a cult is that the organization and or its leaders claim, I alone am the messenger. You cannot get the message, the truth, outside of me, outside of our organization. Mormonism makes this claim. Jehovah's Witness uh, organization makes this claim. If we disfellowship you, if we put you out of our number, you're condemned. You will eternally be lost because after all, we're the only one true organization. Uh, that's really interesting, but what I read in my Bible is, Whosoever believes the message 
shall be saved. I don't see anywhere where it says, whosoever believes the messenger. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I don't see anywhere where a singular messenger is identified as exclusively having the rights to speak the message or exclusively has the power to share the truth. No, 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 no. That is not even close to what the Bible tells us. The Word of God tells us that the message is of supreme importance and the messenger needs to step back and let the message do its work because the power is in the message. Again, the Apostle Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that what believeth, not everybody that belongs to the Watchtower Bible Society, not everyone that belongs to the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the... Uh, of, um, Latter-day Saints, not to everyone that belongs to the Roman Catholic organization. No, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the message of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Hallelujah. It's not about the messenger. You know, this preacher doesn't get up in this pulpit. I'm not standing here today trying to tell people, Oh, Pastor, you probably could build your church if you told people you were the only one true messenger because then people would be scared and they'd say, Well, i, I, I got to be in the church where the one true messenger is at the head. Uh, that would be all well and good. The only problem is it contradicts the Word of God. And I'm not about to preach that kind of tripe. I've had people leave churches I was pastoring and go off to other churches. And I said, are you still in the apostolic faith? Yes, I am. Well, then praise God. Hallelujah. I don't give a flying fig where you go to church. I'm, what concerns me more is what you're believing, not where you're believing it. You're, you don't want to be in this church anymore? Fine. I don't have a problem with that. Just please stay in the church that preaches this message because I believe this message is true and right. You follow what I'm telling you today? doesn't matter to me, Tommy, if I'm pastoring a church and, and people come through the church and they go on to become members of other churches that preach this same truth. That's fine and dandy with me because I've learned to step back. He must increase. I must decrease. Not about how many numbers, how about how many people I get into my sanctuary. It's not about the numbers that I can claim. The Word of God trying to finish. The Word of God tells us in 1 John, excuse me, yes, 1 John 2, 22 through 29. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he 
is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. The message is the most important element here, not the messenger. Absolutely. The messenger is of precious little significance. Lastly, in Philippians 1, 15 through 18, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Philippi. He's talking about the fact that there are preachers, even when the apostles were alive, who were preaching the message of Christ, but not altogether for the right reasons. And listen to what Paul writes. He said, some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached and I therein do rejoice yea and will rejoice what did Paul just say Paul said there are people out there preaching and they're preaching for all the wrong reasons he said you know what I don't care as long as they're preaching Christ, Christ is being preached. Hallelujah. There are people out there in our world today on television who are preaching a message that I don't entirely agree with, that I don't believe is scriptural and true. But you know what? I don't want to cut them off. I don't want to preach against them. I don't want to add to their affliction as the Apostle Paul speaks of people in essence preaching against him because he's in prison. Well, if Paul were doing the right thing, he wouldn't be in jail. You know the old mindset. Anything negative comes into your life, it has to be because you're not doing right. Pastor Charles must not be doing things right or he'd have a whole lot more people in his church today. I guarantee you there are people out there preaching that today. Yep. Paul said, you know what? The power is in the preaching of Christ. It's not in the messenger. It doesn't matter what motivates the messenger so long as Christ is preached. Amen. Many people come into the apostolic way who started their journey in faith believing something they heard on from a television preacher. You know what? If that television preacher, if the only good that comes out of what they're preaching about Jesus, if the only good comes out of it is it starts them on the right track with me, then what business have I to preach against them? What business have I to put them down? If I put them down, I may discourage someone who otherwise would at least begin a journey. Right. Listen, just because they come in through that door doesn't mean that that's where they're going to stay their whole life. No, as they learn more, they understand more, and God reveals more of Himself to them. Their walk with God will get deeper, and one day they may find their way into a one God, Jesus' name, apostolic, Holy Ghost filled, Jesus' name, baptized in church. So leave them well enough alone. Let them that are preaching for all the wrong reasons. Oh, they're preachers on TV. The only reason they're preaching is for money. Uh-huh. But you know what? Even if they're going to answer to God for that. Trust me. They will answer to God for their the intent of their heart. But you know what? They're preaching Jesus. Leave them be. Leave them be. Because you cannot lift up Jesus and go wrong. Hallelujah. But for the rest of us, we need to understand today. We need to step back. We need to humble ourselves. We need to understand the message is not in the messenger. The message has a power all its own. Hallelujah. God is looking for a humble people. A people who are willing like John the Baptist. Not to look at the work they do as some endorsement of their own skills and their own abilities, but they're willing to look and say, hey, I work with what God gives me, whatever that may be. In the end, He must increase. I must decrease. I'm willing to step back. Hallelujah.